speaking of which, hello, Mr. Jordan.
No, not yet. Um, possibly, probably because I've been on the board for the last two weeks. And uh, I do have it here on this, and I keep meaning to watch it because, you know, quite frankly, um, that is going to be so awesome. <laughs> Because, quite frankly, I, I've never seen it, you know? And the thing is, I used to be a movie critic many years ago, right? Um, and I became a movie critic. It was my primary time of being a movie critic was between 91 and 96, which was kind of a donut in Will Wheaton's career. Um, and he did some TV work, but otherwise wasn't doing anything. Um, and I missed reviewing, like, Toy Soldiers, because I started in September 91 by about, like, two or three months or something like that. So. Uh, and of course, I didn't know him until much later. Um, but the thing about it was, I was like, I should go back. I should go back and, and review it, you know, because I know Will now. We're really good friends, and it's part of me just like, when you know, will that color that? And you know, of course, I was like, I should do this. And of course, Will's like, do it, do it now. <laughs> um, so depending on how my day goes today, um, what I will do, if if I have time tonight, uh, what I will end up doing is re watching it and then writing a review, and then tomorrow at the Will and John Super Happy Fun Time, mm -hmm. um, giving it to him to read. <laughs> <laughs> and I wonder that would be like so awesome. But if I don't, if I don't watch it, I may still write the review. <laughs> <laughs> and, and give it to him to read, and it would be just how long, you know, shh, shh, don't tell him. Just how long it takes for him to read. Like, you didn't watch it. This is you're writing a review of TAPS or something like that. <laughs> okay, I, I pulled the thing up. Uh, so I'm going to read from the Mallet of Love and Corrections. Does everybody know what the Mallet of Love and Corrections is? Is there anybody who does not know what the Mallet of Love and Corrections is? Okay. So I have a blog, and the blog is called Whatever. And Whatever is um, pretty well read. It's got about 50,000 readers a day, which is nice. Um, and it has what, what we would like to euphemistically call a spirited. Uh, comment section, <laughs> uh, which means occasionally we'll get the trolls and we get the clueless people and we get some people who are just completely obnoxious. Um, and when they, they come in, because it's really important to have a uh, space where people can actually have a conversation instead of just having, you know, I've come to state my position, screw you all, you know. Uh, so when people come and do that, I delete or moderate their, their comments. And over the course of time, I call that malady. And, uh, and then eventually, you know, uh, the imaginary mallet which I was using the whack from with was called the mallet of loving correction. Because I'm not doing it because I'm angry with you. No, I'm doing it because I love you and I believe you can learn. <laughs> right? So, um, so that's why it's called mallet of loving correction. Now, I actually do now have this big ass mallet <laughs> given to me by the folks at the, uh, at the Worldcon, because I was the Toastmaster last year at the Worldcon, and they just gave me like, this big, and the head's like that big, and it's inscribed to me, and it has a quote, which they say that I've said, which I believe because it sounds like something I would say, because it says, I don't love you any less for being wrong on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like me. I certainly agree that that's something I would say. So, but uh, in any event, um, so that's the, the name of the upcoming new uh, book, which will actually be out September 13th uh, this year, which is also coincidentally, actually not coincidentally at all, the uh, 15th anniversary of the whatever. My blog is actually older than my daughter, that's sort of terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> so, as a preface to this piece, um, most of you know last year was not the best year for uh, gender relations in the uh, world of science fiction and fantasy. There were a lot of dudes who spent a lot of time uh, of being of the opinion that they were able to tell women um, whether or not they were really geeks or not, you know? And, uh, and it reached its head, in my opinion, uh, when CNN.com let a fellow named Joe Peacock write a piece about all those horrible fake geek girls that went to Comic Con. Now, to preface before I begin writing, after the internet dropped on Joe Peacock's head, <laughs> <laughs> Joe Peacock himself uh, decided to go on a quest uh, to understand, you know, what the hell was going on with all these, you know, uh, you know, where the gaps in his knowledge and understanding and empathy and otherwise uh, was going on. And so I genuinely believe that Joe Peacock 
uh, is on the path of righteousness and trying to figure these things out. <laughs> to be that as it may, the article itself really is a good standard representative example of the sort of thinking that was going on at the time. And I felt, uh, I felt qualified to respond to this piece. So the piece I'm going to read to you today is, Who Gets to Be a Geek? Anyone Who Wants to Be. Uh, and it goes like this. Uh, the other day, CNN let some dude named Joe Peacock vomit up an embarrassing piece on its website about how awful it is that geekdom is in the process of being overrun by attractive women dressing up in costume, cosplaying for the uninitiated, uninitiated which is no one in this room, um, <laughs> when they have displayed their geek cred to Mr. Peacock's personal satisfaction. They weren't real geeks, Mr. Peacock maintains. He makes a great show of supporting real geek women, the definition of which presumably are those who have passed his stringent entrance requirements, which I'm sure he has posted somewhere other than the inside of the skull. Uh, and because they're not real geeks, they offend people like him who are real geeks. And this is a quote. There are poachers, there are pox on our culture. As a guy, I find it repugnant that, due to my interest in comic books, sci-fi, fantasy, and role-playing games, Video games and toys, I'm supposed to feel honored that pretty girls in my presence. It's insulting. You're just gross. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? Yeah. <laughs> For the moment, let's leave aside the problem of a mentality that assumes that the primary reason some woman might find it fun and worthwhile to cosplay as one of her favorite science fiction and fantasy characters is to get the attention of some dudes. To focus on another interesting aspect of this piece, namely that Joe Peacock has arrogated to himself the role as speaker for the geeks uh, with the ability to determine whether any particular group of people is worthy of true geekdom. This on the basis, one presumes, of his resume and his longtime affiliation as a geek. Well, fine. <laughs> hey, Joe. Hi, I'm John Scalzi. I'm also a longtime geek. My resume includes three New York Times best-selling science fiction books, three books nominated for the best novel, Hugo. Uh, six other Hugo nominations, as well as Nebula, Locus, Sidewise, and other award nominations. One novel option for a science fiction film, instead consulting for the Stargate Universal Television Show, a long history as, in video games as a player, Atari Yo, and as a writer, including writing for the official US PlayStation magazine for six years and currently writing a game for industrial toys. I wrote a, a column on science fiction film for four years and have two books on the subject. I've been writing this blog for 14 years and one of, was one of the early adopters of self-publishing one's books online. Additionally, three books of mine, including one Hugo winner, have been uh, work originally published online. I was a special guest at this year's Comic-Con. I am the Toastmaster of this year's Worldcon. I am the sitting president of the Science Fiction and Fantasy Writers of America. Here is a picture of my peer group, and this is a picture of me, Corey Doctorow, Charlie Strauss, Neil Stevenson, and Mark Gaiman. And here's another, which was a picture of me, Will Wheaton, Felicia Day, and Patrick Rothfuss. <laughs> I outrank you as speaker for the geeks. You are overruled. Your entire piece is thrown out as condescending, entitled, oblivious, sexist, and obnoxious. And no, you can't object. Well, you can, but you will be summarily overruled. You made the decision based on your life experience as a geek that you could tell other people who is welcome as a geek and who is not. Based on my life experience as a geek, I have made the decision that I am qualified to tell you to suck eggs. <laughs> you want to slap down people who you don't feel qualified for geekdom, then I get to slap you down for being wrong on the basis of being higher up in the geek hierarchy. If you don't like it, then you shouldn't have played this game to begin with. <laughs> you have played your cards, now I have played mine. I have the conk. I will speak. <laughs> Who gets to be a geek? Anyone who wants to be any way they want to be one. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Geekdom is a nation with open borders. There are many affiliations and many doors into it. There are lit geeks, media geeks, comic geeks, anime and manga geeks. There are LARPers, cosplayers, furries, hookers, crafters, gamers, and tabletoppers. 
There are goths and horrors and steampunkers and academics. There are nerd rockers and writers and artists and actors and fans. Some people love only one thing. Some people flip between the fandoms. Some people are positively poly in their geek enthusiasm. <laughs> Okay. Yes. <laughs> some people have been in geekdom since before they even knew they were geeks, and some people are noobs trying out an aspect of geekdom to see if it fits. If it does, great. If it doesn't, then at least they've tried it. Many people believe geekdom is defined by a love of a thing, but I think, and my experience of geekdom bears on this thinking, that the true sign of a geek is a delight in sharing a thing. It's the major di difference between a geek and a hipster, right? Okay. When a hipster sees someone grooving on something they love, their reaction is to say, oh crap, now the wrong people like what I love. When a geek sees someone else grooving on the thing they love, their reaction is to say, oh my god, you love the same thing I love, come to me and we will love it together. <laughs> Any jerk can love a thing. It's the sharing that makes geekdom awesome. So let's take the... Yeah, I love you, man. Yeah. <laughs> Amen, brother. <laughs> yeah, let's take these women cosplayers who Mr. Peacock is so hand-flappingly disgusted with and dismissive of. Let's leave aside, for now, the idea that for those of this group uh, in this group attending Comic-Con, spending literally hundreds, if not thousands of dollars on Comic-Con passes, hotel, transportation, food, not to mention the money and time required to put together a truly excellent costume, is not in itself a signal and an indication of geek commitment. <laughs> Let's say that, in fact, the only reason the women cosplayers are there is to get their cosplay on in front of what is likely to be an appreciative audience. Okay? So what? <laughs> As in, so what if their only victim is cosplay? What if it is? Who does it harm? Who is materially injured by this fact? Who, upon seeing a woman cosplaying without an accompany, accompanying curriculum vitae, uh, posted above her head on a stick, laying out her geek bona fides, <laughs> says to him or herself, Everything I love about my geekdom has turned to ashes in my mouth. <laughs> and then please from the San Diego Convention Center, weeping. <laughs> if there is such an unfortunate soul, is this uh, the fragile pathology of their own geekdom the concern of the cosplaying woman? It seems highly doubtful that the woman spent hundreds, if not thousands, of dollars to show up in San Diego just to ruin some randomly oversensitive geek's day. <laughs> it's rather more likely she came to enjoy herself in a place where her expression of her own geekiness would be appreciated. So what if her geekiness is not your own? So what if she isn't into the geek life as deeply as you believe you are or that you think she should be? So what if she doesn't have a geek love of the things you have a geek love for? Is the appropriate response for this fact to call her gross and a poacher and maintain she's only in it to be slavered over by dudes who, in your unwarranted condescension, you judge to be not nearly as enlightened to the ways of geek women as you? Or would a more appropriate response be to say, great costume, and then maybe welcome her into the parts of geekdom that you love so that she might possibly grow to love them too? What do you gain from complaining about her fakey fake fakeness except a momentarily and entirely erroneous feeling of deep superiority coupled with a permanent record of your sexism against women you don't see being the right kind of geek? <laughs> These are your choices. Although, there is actually a third choice. Just let her be to do her own thing. Because this is a funny fact. Her geekdom is not about you. At all. <laughs> geekdom is personal. Geekdom varies from person to person. There are many ways to be a geek, as there are people who love a thing and love sharing that thing with others. You don't get to define their geekdom, they don't get to define yours. What you can do is share your expression of geekdom with others. And maybe they will get you, and maybe they won't. And if they get you, that's great. If they don't, that's their problem and not yours. 
So be your own being. Love what you love and share it with anyone who will listen. One other thing. There is no speaker for the geeks. It's not Joe Peacock. It's not me. It's not anyone. If anyone tells you that there is a right way to be a geek, or that someone else is not a geek, or shouldn't be seen as a geek, or that you are not a geek, then you can tell them to fuck right off. <laughs> Both your defense. So go cosplay or play film or read that Doctor Who novel or whatever it is that you want to do. Geekdom is flat. There is no hierarchy. There's no leveling up required or secret handshake or entrance examination. There's just you. Anyone can be a geek any way they want to. And that means you too. Whoever you are. And if anyone tells you different, you send them to me. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I'm not going to lie, I kind of knew that one was going to go over well. <laughs> I had that feeling, right? And there might be a guy out there who's like, oh, let's keep going. I guess I'll just keep quiet. <laughs> so, uh, but anyway, so that's the, that's the reading for today. And uh, like I said, with the with the horrible science fiction that I wrote when I was in junior high, by all means, uh, I'll take that down uh, to my signing place, which is what, 24, 23. And uh, if anybody wants to look at it, Days and uh, <laughs> that would be that. But now we come to the part where I perform like a monkey for all of you and ask, answer any questions that you have. You can ask questions about books, you can ask questions about movies, you can ask questions about blog, the blog, you can ask personal questions, those deep, burning personal questions that you always wanted to know. I will answer any question that you ask, although I must warn you that sometimes the answer is, that's none of your business, I can't believe you asked that. Leave <laughs> the room, you son of a bitch. So, <laughs> so first question, over there in the back. How was working on Stargate Universe? How was working on Stargate Universe? It was awesome. <laughs> and I, I will tell you about which was that uh, Joe Malazzi, who is a uh, uh, Stargate producer, right? Hi, Pace, by the way. I hope that's okay. Uh, I'm sorry for you. <laughs> um, Joe Malazzi was, was a fan. He read Old Man's War. He liked it. And, uh, you know, two things happened there. It was like, one, you know, he really enjoyed it. And he thought it would be a good writer. Uh, and, you know, I'm on the internet, so I'm easy to find. So he sent me something. He's like, you know, we're currently doing Stargate Lenses. Would you like to write an episode for us? Um, which was awesome, you know, it was like people were like, hi, ah, would you like to write for this very successful television show? Um, and I turned him down, and it wasn't because, yeah, exactly, <laughs> <laughs> very expression on your face there, so. Um, and the right reason was because I didn't watch Stargate Universe, and I didn't want to be that dick who kind of comes in and goes, well, yes, I'll write a screenplay for your, your television show. No, I don't know anything about it. Ha, 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 here you go. And it would have been terrible. It would have been awful, you know, and they would have salvaged it in some sort of way and completely rewritten it or something like that, but it would be bad. And I don't like to publicly show off my bad writing. So uh, I turned him down and I was like, you know, it's not that I'm not appreciative, it's just simply that, you know, I, I'm the wrong person. And he said, well, you know, later on we might be doing a new Stargate series. Would you like to be on that, you know, when that happens? And I was like, yeah, absolutely, sure. And then I didn't think about it again for like a year or more because, you know, it's all Hollywood, right? Love you, don't change, you're awesome. <laughs> and you learn that the Hollywood thing is like, you know, it's like, this is fantastic, translation, eh, you know. <laughs> or we'll totally work together is I'm, I'm having a court order put against you. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you don't really pay attention, but then a year passes and I get this email from Joe again. It's like, okay, so we're starting up what we're calling Stargate Universe. You remember when you said that you would want to do it, you want to do it, and I'm like, yeah, sure. So they sent me their first script, and they had me read it, and then they flew me out to the Bridge Studios, which is in Vancouver, and I met Joe, and I met Brad, and I met all the people who were involved, and we had a nice conversation, and we figured out that indeed we could, you know, work together. Um, and then from there, it actually was really simple, which is, you know, quite frankly, they would send me the scripts, and I would read them, uh, and I would basically, my job was to tell them, what they were doing wrong. Or more accurately, okay, you know how you know how you go to like one of those Comic Cons and like they'll have a panel on the Stargate thing, and you know those kids in the Comic Cons, right? They kind of excuse me, in episode seven, 
you had this happen, but clearly episode five and episode three, these were these three things that happened that show that in fact what you had happened in episode seven can't happen. So I was wondering. <laughs> <laughs> I got paid to be that guy. <laughs> so that none of all y'all could do that. <laughs> I stole your joy. I'm a professional nerd joy stealer. <laughs> that was my gig. And I loved it because like, I would read those scripts and I, you know, I, would do, I would do two things. I would be the, the science advisor uh, and I would keep track of all the characters in the larger narrative arc because all the other writers and the producers were focused on getting each episode done. And I would tell them things like, you know, for example, um, there was one script uh, which will be amusing to you. It was like, it has a script where it's like, you know, someone needs to walk down a hall. And in the script itself, it says, Richard walks down the hall. Right? And I'm like, this is going to be a bad hall. <laughs> so Richard walks down the hall. <laughs> they get. And I had to tell them, no, you can't kill people off. Because the entire show is, for those of you who don't know, they get, you know, stargated into this super old ancient Star, Starships is like a billion years old or something like that. That's way, way far out there, like in the Horjolian Hor super cluster, um, which I just pronounced horribly and I'm ashamed of myself. But, uh, but the simple fact is, is that and there's, they can't get back. They can't like just get new crew members, right? So any crew member you kill is a crew member who's gone. And uh, if you do enough of that, and they were just thinking on autopilot about it, um, then within the end of the, by the end of the first season, there's like five people, and those are the title <laughs> card players, right? <laughs> so I said, no, you can't, you can't kill them. You can't kill them, um, which is why if you actually watch Stargate Universe over the course of the two seasons, not a lot of people die. They get really fucked up. Right? <laughs> it's really badly made, like, oh, he's got 30 degree burns, or oh, he's, he's lost his pancreas and stuff like that. <laughs> So that was me. I got to do that. But I also wrote things like, you know, they're like, you know, uh, icicles up there, they spray bullets. I'm like, those are bullets you don't have anymore. You know? Um, and so I was literally like, you know, like nerd account, John Scalzi nerd account. Oh, that's a that's bullet you don't have anymore. It's like, oh, that's, a, that's an apple you don't have anymore. Are you sure you want to spend that apple? You know? <laughs> why did we hire this dude? I was like, this is why you hired him. Because somebody has to be that guy. Um, the other thing is like with, with, the, with their science, right? Um, there, was that, there was a scene like the, or the episode, like the second or third episode where we find out how the destiny recharges, right? It recharges by diving into a storm. And, you know, because that seems really cheap and easy. And, uh, <laughs> and the thing is, is that the way that they originally had it done, it, had it done was that they were going to do it, uh, a, a gravity slingshot across the planet uh, into a yellow star, and this planet had to be in a Goldilocks zone around the yellow star. Well, the thing is, is there are a couple things going on. One, um, if you have a yellow star, your Goldilocks zone, zone is somewhere between 80 and 120 million miles away, right? It's a fair, it's a fair distance, and we know this because our sun is a G2 star, which means it's a yellow star, and we are 93 million miles more or less, depending on where we are in the orbit, uh, away from the sun. And so I kind of pointed out to them, you know, in fact, if you tried to do a gravity slingshot and get to the sun uh, as quickly as you were going to do, the speeds that you would be needing to come out of the actual, um, you know, faster than light drive and stuff like that, then try to do a gravity slingshot around that planet, basically what you would do is go, boom, and you would never actually get the benefit of the gravity slingshot at all. Moreover, you know, since it's 80 million miles away, um, you would never get that you know, you would never cross that expanse of space and time for what you have uh, written in the show. And so, so what you need to do is you actually need to have a, just a really small red dwarf so that the actual Goldilocks zone is very close to the star itself. And instead of trying to do the gravity slingshot, maybe you try to do arrow breaking or something like that. You know, whatever it was that we did. But this, this occasion, the, you know, the phone call from Brad, and he calls up and he's like, do we really have to move the entire... <laughs> and I remember just being on the phone going, this is my job, <laughs> moving planets. <laughs> and so in that episode, you know, they have a red star, the planet's really close by, they do the arrow right now, this is what they do. Um, and all of that is me, that's my star. I made that little red star, <laughs> you know, all that's, that's Scalzi's star. 
And the thing is, is that if I've done my job correctly, the only way you know that that is my star or that any of that stuff happened is because I am telling you right now. That the whole job of my, my entire job is to get you through the entire 60 minutes of the, of the you know, episode, you know, plus commercials. Get it through the whole thing, you go, okay, 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 the episode gets done, and then you go, no, wait a minute, but it's too late. We've already done the entire episode. We're done. You lose. We get, to get, we get you back next week. And so we, we, that's, that was my job, is just to keep you in the thing for the entire run of the, of the episode where you're enjoying it. And, you know, sometimes we could do it, and sometimes we couldn't. And there would be some time where I was like, you really have to fix this, and they're like, it's too late, we've already done the special effects. And that was, you know, part and pro parcel of doing a weekly television series. But uh, generally speaking, they were great with me. They took m uh, a lot of my suggestions. The ones that they didn't, they always had good reasons not to. Um, I dedicated, co-dedicated red shirts to, to, to Brad and to, to Joe in appreciation. And I made sure in the acknowledgments of that book to point out that this horrible show, that, you know, uh, the, all the horrible shows that I mined, or red shirts cliches uh, had nothing to do with Stargate University itself. So that's the answer to that. Uh, next question. Uh, since you since you're my A man, man, go for it. Okay. Um, can you tell us anything uh, new about uh, the Old Man's War movie? The Old Man's War movie. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Old Man's War, which was my first published novel, has been optioned for uh, a film by Paramount Pictures. Uh, Wolfgang Peterson is slated to direct. Um, and the answer to that is, and I was just talking to my friend Tom over here, um, they're, they're still in the script writing phase. Uh, and on one, one hand, it's a little flummoxing because I wrote that book in three months, and they've had four years to write the script. <laughs> <laughs> and I wrote the whole thing from nothing, and they've got a, you know, they've got a book to adapt. <laughs> but that's, you know, that's kind of Hollywood, and I am torn. I'm torn between, you know, sort of like, I want you to make the movie because, you know, people would be sitting there eating your popcorn and going, movie bubble. <laughs> and, you know, but the, but the flip side of that is the longer they take, the more money I get because they have to renew the option. <laughs> and it's sort of, and so there's, there's that tension there. It's like, you know, on one hand, I want them to make the movie, the movie would be awesome. On the other hand, you know, January 1st comes up, you know, you know, bing, bing, there's somebody at the door, you open it up. Hi, I'm from Hollywood. Here's your check for doing nothing. <laughs> I will put all this money over here in the hot tub with the other money. <laughs> Honestly, I don't know what to do with all that money. You can share. <laughs> yeah, I was about to say, leave the room instantly. <laughs> I'm going to be sharing it. I'm going to be sharing it with, with, with whatever college my daughter goes to. <laughs> That's basically what that comes down to. Yes, sir. Um, so, any D&D players in the audience know that the pronunciation of certain characters is a critical issue. Drow or dro. So I would like to know, from the source of oh, the God. Old Man's War, how are some of your aliens pronounced? I know Kansu is pretty... Kansu is pretty... But some of the other ones, how do they, how do they sound? No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm typing them. <laughs> and, and besides which, even if I told you what they were like, there, there was a dude who does, uh, you know, who created, you know, uh, the, the guests, right? And he goes, no, it's the GIFs. And, and like everybody, and then there's like a war of people who are like, the way dot G-I-F, right? Is it GIF or is it, is it GIF? And the answer is it's obviously GIF because it's graphics. Yeah. <laughs> But you know, the guy did it, I was like, no, it's Jeff, he's screwing with us. <laughs> he, knows, he knows that there's going to be an argument about that sort of stuff, and he's just going to go back and just sit there and go, yes. Meanwhile, you will all still be using my graphics. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, in some ways it doesn't matter. And the part of it is, is actually the way that I find it. Here's how I find out how stuff is pronounced. I often wait for the audio book. <laughs> The poor man who has to do uh, the Human Division audio book. Who's got, who's got a copy of the uh, Human Division here? Does anyone have a copy of the Human Division? Uh, bring it up for me for a second. Because <laughs> I, I gotta remember how I actually... Because I did a terrible thing with my audio guy. Um, and it was intentional. Uh, which is, here we go, 243. Uh, with the observers. I have a character 
that is named. Okay, uh, there is a character whose the first name is spelled B L B L L L B L B L B. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the last name is D-O-O-D-O-O-D-O. -O -O -O. And I give the petition, whose name was most accurately pronounced by humans by moving their finger rapidly back and forth on their lips, and then putting the second half. So the guy's name is... <laughs> <laughs> Back. 
to the end of the line, you know. I don't know what we're gonna do. She's sitting there going, oh shit, oh shit. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, okay, there's the first just stop, relax, breathe, you know, be calm. And she's like, it's like, okay, are you are you calm? Yeah, everything I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. I just Okay, good, good. Oh, by the way, you're for fools. <laughs> <laughs> I lost a friend that day. <laughs> so that's probably the best friend I've had. <laughs> so, I, I love your writing, and I, I bought just, well, probably not everything you've written, because I don't know everything you've written, and I don't have a thing in high school, but. <laughs> but with, with your red shirts. Yeah. The coda. Yeah. I mean, when I, I read I read reviews of red shirts, and, yeah. and it's like everybody gets it except they don't really get the coda. And, and I'll tell you, I was about to say, if you tell me, tell us about spoilers because there are people who haven't read. The people who haven't read red shirts. <laughs> yeah, so avoid spoilers, but go ahead and talk in general. It's like, oh. <laughs> so, why, so why the coda? There are so many different ways that book could have ended that I thought would have been much more. The codas really actually are um, divisive in some sort of way. Not like divisive now we shall have to fight sort of thing. But, uh, uh, but there are people who love the novel proper. There, there's the novel proper and then there are three codas. Um, and I've seen reviews that are like, the novel is great, the code is mid. Um, there are other people who like a novel, man, the codas are brilliant. There are people who like folk, um, and then there are other people like, oh, I don't know why anyone thinks this is funny, and John Spalding well, should be most competitive. <laughs> <laughs> I just count the latter two. Um, but, uh, but the simple fact of the matter is, there, there are some reasons why I, I, I did the codas, which are, when I originally wrote Red Shirt, what, I, what, what my plan in my brain was, because I was going to write three 40,000 word novels, you know, which was 40,000 to 60,000 used to be the regular length of a novel back in a uh, science fiction novel in the 50s, 60s, and 60s back during the sort of the pulp era. And uh, I would write three very quick pulp novels, just bang them out, you know, don't think about them in the sort of sense, and put them all together in a 120,000 word volume called Triple Feature. Because 100,000 words is basically the contractual obligation that I have for novels. They have to be within 10% of 100,000 words. Because that's about the right size on a bookshop. That's the only reason why they, they are contractually obligated to be that way. Because it looks good on a bookshop. Um, if you notice, all my books, almost all of them except for uh, Human Division, uh, are all almost exactly 320 pages. It doesn't matter. And that is for books that range from 80,000 words to 114,000 words. They're all 320 pages because that is the platonic ideal of a hardcover book that you put on a bookshop in a, in a Barnes and Noble. Uh, but uh, in this particular case, I overshot 40,000 because the book needed to be longer. It got to about 55,000 words. And 55,000 words was fine, and I could have just given it to 200 and would have done something with it. But I also knew about this, you know, they wanted to be a certain size. Um, so I decided that I needed to add some, some more stuff to it, but I didn't want to go in and just sort of stuff the novel because the novel was, in my opinion, great as it was. And, and I'm the sort of writing snob, and also I'm now of enough of a person that I don't have to do that. You know, I can go, it's a 50,000 word novel, there it is, deal with it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, but I also left some things dangling, which was sort of the uh, philosophical implications of constructing the universe the way that I constructed the universe. And I wanted to sort of address that. Now, the book, it's not a spoiler to give anything away, but the, the main characters of the book would be uh, equivalent to the bit players in a larger sort of drama, right? You know, it's not the captain, it's not you know, the medical officer, it's not all those sorts of people, it's the ensigns and you know, the regular crew members. So that they are, you know, bit players, but they become protagonists. In the codas, it gives me an opportunity to actually, or actually sort of replicate that. There are bit players in the novel who then become the protagonists of the codas. And I thought formalistically, uh, formal, uh, formally and stylistically, that was an interesting thing to do. So that's one reason to do it. The other thing is that there were emotional aspects of the, you know, 
of the implications of that universe that I didn't feel were completely addressed and I wanted to address them. Um, and that also, once the novel itself was completed, um, I was able to have the ability to shift tone a little bit and play with, with other aspects of it. So in, in many ways, it was a, a, it was a kind of experiment with form, which is, you know, here's the novel. By the way, here are these three associated codas. If you only read the novel, you still get a whole story. It's still awesome. It's chapter 24 is my favorite chapter of all time. Uh, and, and all that sort of stuff. But if you read the codas, then there is something extra you get with the entire universe, maybe with a little more emotional resonance. And there are some people who are going to dig that, and there are some people who are not. Um, but that's fun. I mean, I don't worry about whether or not everybody gets every single thing I get or likes every single thing I get. I was mentioning to somebody earlier that, you know, my, one of my favorite musicians is John Lennon. You know, both with the Beatles and his solo artists. But he has entire albums. I'm like, I will never need to listen to that again. You know, uh, simply because, you know, he was fearless and occasionally he faked, right? And that's fun. Uh, I still think he's wonderful. There are writers who I love as writers. Uh, like, for example, China Diego. I think Perdido Street Station has been the best science fiction novel published since 2000, right? Um, but he has The Scar, which was the fall off. I'm like, eh, I can, look, I can take it or leave it. And there are other books of his that I'm similarly not you know, thrilled with, but then there are other ones where I'm like, it's, this is great stuff. You recognize that not everything is going to work for you because you are your own person, they're their own person, they have things that they want to do, you have things you want to read sometimes. Hopefully, more often than not, there's a line, and sometimes they don't, you know? And you, you kind of accept that. I thought it was necessary, both for purely practical publishing reasons and then for you know, philosophical reasons relating to the construction of the novel that I needed to write the code. So I did, and like I said, some people are going to dig them, and some people aren't, and, and that's fine. If you didn't dig them, that's great. You still have the novel itself, which is literally self-contained. You don't have to read the code, and you can think of it as something, so it puts out very well. Yes? I uh, started reading your blog sometime last year, and I ended up buying all the things more because of the blog. Right. Why do you think more authors don't blog? Uh, I think because it's hard. Um, I mean, and it's giving away it's giving away writing for free, which is you know a lot of people are like what are you doing? And I totally understand that because I yell at writers all the time, you know, for you know not being paid for the work. Um, although usually it's the mechanism of somebody else saying I want to publish your stuff. No, I don't want to pay you, but I'll give you exposure because it's exposure. You could die of exposure. <laughs> uh, but uh, all writers are different, right? There, if you if you meet if you go down to the writer row, you know the 2400 block of, of the Comic Con, uh, you will see about 20 different writers, and they're all completely different people, and they all have completely different processes, and they all have different ways of dealing with you, not you personally, but just you in a general sense. And some of them are really well socialized, and some of them so very aren't. You know, not just those <laughs> people, but in a larger sense. Uh, and some people are really good with the social media thing, that they can tweet and have fun with it and all that sort of stuff, or blog and write those long blog posts, or they even do all sorts of things. And then some can't, you know, and they're, you know, they're told by their publicists, oh, you should do a blog or you should do, you know, Facebook or, or that sort of stuff. So they're kind of gradually kind of go, well, here I am on Facebook, or here I am on Twitter. And you can tell immediately that they would rather just be <laughs> right? um, and so the answer is, if that's not what you want to do, then for God's sake, don't do it. You know, because you're going to be terrible at it, and it's going to have the opposite effect. You know, there are going to be writers for whom all they want to do is write the novel. If they're good enough or they're lucky enough, which are two entirely separate things, you should know, um, then it won't matter. People will still come to writing and, and want to, to read it. There are other folks, you know, there are other folks there who are just fantastic social media people and people who love them and all this sort of stuff and they write the books and the books are, you know, um, but they're really good at marketing themselves and that sort of balances it out. If you're lucky, you get to be both because in this particular era of things, um, those of us who are at least slightly most, you know, uh, media savvy, uh, it makes it easier for us to, you know, talk to all of you. I mean, I go on tour for three weeks straight. This is my third year, three weeks straight on tour. And part of the reason is that tour knows that when I go out on tour, 
be funny, I'm going to be engaging, I'm actually going to be able to give you, you know, the feeling that I'm actually enjoying this process instead of like, oh God, oh God. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I do enjoy it. And it's, I mean, it, all that sort of stuff, but it is something that there are other people who are just, where the tours are torture, you know, and they shouldn't tour, you know. Um, but it is, it really is dependent on, on the authors themselves. Some are good at this crap. You know, and some really aren't. And it, it's kind of unfair to say all authors have to be doing this or need to be doing this. It's like, you know what, some authors, all they need to be doing is writing their books. And let other people take care of all the, all the rest of the stuff. Um, and then other people are just, other people are, wind them up and go. I really am a wind them up and go sort of guy. I mean, I don't know if you can tell, but I'm not really the shy retiring type. <laughs> pretty quick on my feet and all that sort of stuff. So this sort of stuff works for me, which is why they put me on tour, because they know that I'm not going to freak out. I have a great story, because publicists tell me horror stories about their, their authors. And one of the great uh, horror stories that I've heard from a publicist, and I won't name anybody involved, but apparently at one point or another, um, there was a, uh, an author who called up you know, his PR person like in, in the middle of the night. You know, and he's in, she's in New York, he's wherever, I think he's on the West Coast, so I'm like, I have a problem, I have a really big problem, I have a really big problem, I don't know how to resolve it, it has to be dealt with because it's a really big problem. And she's like, what is it, what is it, what is it? Because, you know, it's a really big problem. And she's going all in the middle of the night, and she was asleep. So, I, I'm at my hotel, I'm at my hotel, I'm at my hotel, and I'm in my room, I'm in my room, and the pillows are lumpy. <laughs> she's like, <laughs> but she doesn't say, she says, we will get this address, I will call and downstairs. We'll deal with this sort of stuff. Some people tell us. Okay? Some people should be on tour. <laughs> <laughs> the great thing is that afterwards I'd be like talking to you know, my that publicist has since gone on to other things, but every time I text her, it's like, oh, no, no, need to do this and this is gonna happen. Okay, I understand. Okay, that's great. Alright, talk to you later, Lumpy Pills. You know. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, again, you know. Crazy thing, and I like if I, this is actually the. I've been on tour for two weeks straight from home. I left on my birthday, and then I, I'm here. This is the second week. Yes, thank you for leaving me. We'll fly you on my birthday. And I won't go home until literally the end of month, May 31st. So I will be gone for you know three straight weeks. Um, and that's a lot. It really is. I haven't seen my kid, uh, I haven't seen my wife. Uh, I, honestly, I tell you, if it wasn't for the groupies and drugs, I'd never know how it is. <laughs> really? You have groupies? <laughs> I have a groupie story. Would you like to hear my groupie story? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> of course you would. <laughs> is there another story? Uh, are there are any other stories. Not worth telling, sir. No. Oh. <laughs> um, actually, I shouldn't tell the groupie story. Like, that person is still out there, and I don't know. About Mark. <laughs> But it doesn't leave this room. You can't get to the camera yet. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I do occasionally get asked over, uh, you know, groupies. I'm like, okay, hey, writer. Um, <laughs> second of all, <laughs> right? I have to get my own spark in person. So, so the answer is generally no. But I do have a, a stomp, a common stomp phrase. Which is, uh, as far as the, the, the groupy thing goes, it's like, you clear it with one my, my wife, we're all good. You know, so go check, you know, go ask her. See what she, see what you get, right? Which I think answers it pretty well, because, you know, quite frankly, you know, A, shuts the responsibility off to my wife, who's really the more efficient person in the family. Uh, and second of all, no one's going to go out to my wife and go, hi. And I am kind of terrified, because one day I really think this really, you know, Chucky Leather Bear is going to come up and say, I talked to your wife. Come along now. Because <laughs> I can totally see you're doing that. You're like, oh, you know, just get some pictures. <laughs> so, what you get, right? You know, you're going to check with my wife, right? Um, and then after one of these sessions, this, this woman comes in, I need you to come over here, so I'm going to use you as an example. So come here. <laughs> yeah, you get to be me. Okay, so stand there, and I apologize in advance for what I'm about to do. <laughs>
guy that cannot leave this room. This woman had a cold sore this side. I can <laughs> die. And I'm like, you're propositioning me, and you are actually shedding her people. Because <laughs> I understand there's a group. So. <laughs> so I it was very polite. I was like, thank you, no. You know, it was, it was a comedy thing. And, you know, if it changes, I'll be sure to let you know. <laughs> she leaves. Very pleasant woman otherwise, to be fair. Go and take the elevator up to my room. Lie on the bed in a fetal position for about three hours. <laughs> So that's my glamorous story. <laughs> swear, swear it's not going to leave this room. <laughs> uh, what? Yeah. <laughs> what you talking about? Uh, and in fact, actually, I think that pretty much takes us to the end of our time because it's now uh, about 1 o'clock. I know, guys, I love you all too. Uh, for those of you who are actually wanting more of this sort of one-on-one -on -one experience that we're having right now, if you do actually leave the convention at some point today, I will be at the Poison Pen uh, Bookstore at 5 o'clock. I'm going to be interviewed by uh, Sam uh, Sykes, and I may, I may do a little more reading there, and we'll definitely do more Q&A. I promise we won't overlap on all the stuff I was talking about here, although it probably will. But come on down, and it will be great to see you. Otherwise, thank you so much for coming.